Hi there, my name is Dr. Stewart and today we're talking about the spinal cord. So spinal cord is obviously really important. It's a part of the central nervous system that allows the body to communicate with the brain inside of our skull. It extends um, basically from the base of the skull right here at the first cervical vertebrae at atlas all the way down to the bottom or the inferior side of our first lumbar vertebrae or L L1. Um, it is actually pretty small. It's a lot smaller than you might think it is. So here is a thoracic vertebrae and um, we're looking at kind of the superior side of it. This hole right here, that's called the vertebral foramen, and that is the hole that houses and protects the spinal cord. All these vertebrae are kind of stacked on top of each other. Well, the spinal cord is going to sit inside this vertebral foramen, and it's going to be about the size of this pencil, because it's not just the spinal cord that sits in this vertebral foramen. You're going to have the meninges that cover it. We'll talk about that a little bit. Those are protective coverings around the spinal cord. In addition, you're going to have some um, adipose tissue in this epidural space, which is around the meninges, which helps to cushion the spinal cord. So the spinal cord itself is about the size of this uh, pencil, maybe a little bit larger, maybe about the size of that Sharpie marker, but really quite small. So what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to get kind of fancy and, and draw what the spinal cord looks like um, from kind of a three quarters view. So right down here, I've drawn an illustration of a thoracic vertebrae, kind of looking at it like this. So we're looking at it from kind of the lateral, but also the superior view, kind of down onto it. And um, this column of tissue extending upwards, that's the spinal cord, and it's getting larger because it's kind of, kind of coming towards you, okay? Well, the first thing that I want you to kind of notice is that you're gonna have these little um, nerves that extend off of the side of the spinal cord as it passes through the vertebrae. Those are called the spinal nerves. And we've got 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And um, between each vertebrae, you're gonna have a spinal nerve that comes off to the right side and off to the left side. So if I kinda um, darken this in, you're gonna have a spinal nerve that kinda extends out like this. And another spinal nerve that kinda extends out like that. All right, so that's kind of the position of um, those spinal nerves. And the spinal cord itself is going to extend upwards kind of like this. Just like that. And the reason that I drew kind of this bottom portion of the spinal cord in blue is because this blue covering represents the outermost layer of the meninges, which is the dura mater. Beneath this blue covering, that's where you're going to find the, the two um, deeper layers of the meninges, the arachnoid and the pia. I'm not really going to draw those just for simplicity, but this blue layer does kind of represent the So what all these kind of blue extensions represent are the spinal nerves that are emerging out to the side of um, the spinal cord, and they're covered by this outer covering of the meninges called the dura. Now, one thing that I also wanted to mention is that on surrounded or surrounding this spinal cord in the um, vertebral foramen is going to be a bunch of this adipose tissue. That's what all this kind of orange um, represents is all the adipose tissue, which is really kind of like encasing the spinal cord and its function is to help cushion it. So you're gonna have all this kind of orange adipose tissue which is covering it. I'm not gonna draw this adipose tissue extending all the way up just for simplicity, but it kind of gives you an idea of all that fat that's in there that's really um, that's covering the spinal cord. Kind of looks like that, all right? And it'll be kind of continuous with some of these spinal nerves that look like that, all right? So that's all this adipose tissue. Then you'll have the dura uh, mater right here. Let me label this guy. So this is the uh, dura mater. He's gonna be located right here. That's the blue covering. Adipose tissue is the stuff in orange. Tissue. It's gonna be in orange. And then each one of these kind of pairs of nerves, those are spinal nerves. Right there. Okay. Now, 
when we get to this level, I'm going to kind of peel back or, or, or kind of peel back the, the duramater so we can see what's inside. And I'm going to admit the arachnoid and the piamater just because they're so small and be hard, kind of hard to draw. But this kind of lighter yellow structure that you see kind of emerging up, that is going to represent the spinal cord that was really housed inside of the dura, just like that. Okay. And then when we get really kind of far up here to about this level, what I'm going to do is I'm, we're going to bisect or cut the spinal cord into a cross or transverse section so we can see what's inside this, this guy. Okay. And you'll notice that this is kind of the shape of the spinal cord right about like this. Spinal cord looks just like that. It's going to have a pretty significant sulcus or fissure on the anterior side. So I should have done this before, but when we're looking at this spinal cord, if this is the vertebrae like this, just how I drew it, this side where you have the body of the vertebrae, that's the anterior side of this, the, the, the vertebrae and the spinal cord. So this is going to be like the, the front of the body or the anterior part of the body. And then back here where you have the spinous process, that's the posterior part of the body. So this side of the spinal cord, that's anterior, back is posterior. And what we've done is we've bisected this spinal cord right about here so that you can really see what's inside. So we're kind of looking at the lateral view, but we cut the spinal cord right about there. You're going to have a pretty significant groove or fissure on this anterior side. That's called the anterior median fissure. So anterior median fissure. He's going to be located right there. And then this is the dorsal median fissure on the on the posterior side. So if we kind of scoot it down, you have the dorsal median fissure. Can't write. And then right here in the middle, you're going to have a central canal, which is going to be filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Now, this is what's really interesting about the spinal cord is if you look inside after we did this cross section. You'll notice that on the inside of the spinal cord near the center, that's where we're going to have this darker tissue. That's gray matter. And then around the periphery, that's where you're going to have the white matter. So it's the exact opposite of what you found in the brain, where the white matter was on the inside of the, of the brain and the gray matter was near the periphery, near the cortex. And the spinal cord is the opposite. You're going to have this very distinct kind of shape of gray matter. Almost looks like an upside down butterfly where you have like the, um, you know, the wing of the butterfly here and here's like the bottom of the wing. But these are all um, parts of gray matter. Now, each one of these little lobes of gray matter on each side of the spinal cord is called a horn. On this side, you're going to have the ventral horn because it's on the ventral side of the body. So this is the ventral horn. It's going to be located right there. The lateral horn is here. So let me label that um, lateral horn. Is going to be located right here, and then the dorsal horn is right there. He's going to be located right there. All right, perfect. Now um, you'll see that the uh, spinal nerve really emerges from both the ventral and the dorsal side of this gray matter. You're going to have extensions of the ventral horn. You have these tiny little. Um, uh, bits of, of neurons. These are called rootlets. They look like these little um, extensions of the ventral horn. They're going to extend out and they're going to create um, this uh, nerve in, that I've drawn in yellow. The name of that nerve is called the ventral root. Okay, so you're going to have, let me kind of draw this out, you're going to have the ventral root which kind of extends out like that and like that and they're really extensions of these little nerve fibers that extend out of the ventral horn on either side. So here, it looks like that, then like that. And the name of this nerve that I just drew, this is called the ventral root. So, circle, and that is the ventral root. These little small appendages, those are called rootlets. These guys are located right there. And then on the dorsal side, you're going to have 
a dorsal root, which is made by these extensions of the dorsal horn. So these guys are going to extend out like that, and that forms another nerve that kind of comes out and looks like that. That's called the dorsal root. It has a little bulge right here that's significant, and we'll talk about what happens with that bulge here in a second. Let me draw it on both sides. It looks like that, and then like this. Good. So let me label this. This is going to be the dorsal root. Right here, let me circle him. And I kind of drew another pair of these guys down below, so let me outline him to be consistent. Okay, perfect. Now, let's talk about kind of the significance of what happens in all of these horns and roots. First, I'm going to draw kind of the pathway that sensory afferent neurons take. So in blue, Everything that I draw in blue is going to um, represent sensory afferent neurons. So sensory afferent neurons. Okay. What you're going to find is these sensory afferents, these are going to be carrying information to the brain. And they're going to be coming in from the body. They're carrying information about pain, about pressure, um, even pain from our visceral organs, like our um, sensations from places like our stomach. So you're going to have these sensory afferent neurons, and they're going to be coming in in this direction. And they are traveling in that direction. Right? They're carrying information to the spinal cord, to the brain. Well, when they get to the location of this spinal nerve right here, that's where the ventral root and the dorsal root kind of combine. These guys are going to go towards the dorsal side. They're going to go in this dorsal root. They're going to get to this little bulge in the dorsal uh, root right here. That's where the cell bodies of these sensory afferent neurons are going to um, be located. And um, the cell bodies are going to be kind of located off to the side of the axon with this tiny little appendage. If you guys remember, this is actually called a unipolar neuron. So these sensory afferent neurons that enter into the spinal cord are actually examples of unipolar neurons. They're going to um, go to the dorsal root. The cell bodies are going to be located in this bulge. The name of this bulge is called the dorsal ganglion. Let me label that. And if you guys remember, a dorsal a ganglion is just a fancy term for a collection of neuron cell bodies. So this dorsal ganglion is located right there. It's just a collection of these cell bodies. The axon continues. He goes all the way up this dorsal root. He's going to come over here. And then he's going to connect to another neuron, which is going to be located right here in the, um, in the dorsal horn, really on the, the posterior side of this dorsal horn near its tip. If it was a sensory afferent neuron that's coming from one of our visceral organs, like our stomach, it would probably connect a little bit further down, um, a little bit more anterior, but still in this dorsal horn, whereas the sensory afferent neurons that are coming from places like, you know, our hands that give us our sense of touch or pain, those are going to be located near the tip of that dorsal horn. Another example of um, what happens here is with somatic motor neurons. So these are motor neurons that are going out to um, stimulate skeletal muscles. So these are, you know, motor functions that we can consciously control. What happens here is that the cell body of these motor neurons are going to be located in the ventral horn. They're going to be located right here. The axon is going to emerge from the ventral horn. It's going to go out of the ventral root. It's going to travel down the ventral root, and then it's going to go to the spinal nerve, where then it's going to continue out to the muscle fiber that it needs to stimulate in the body. So these efferent somatic motor neurons are going to be located more in the ventral root. They're going to be located in the ventral root where sensory afferents are in the dorsal root. Another example of a motor neuron, this is going to be an autonomic motor neuron. I'm going to draw this guy in pink. I hope it's different enough to see. So actually I'm going to draw it in gray because gray will be definitely uh, different. So this is an autonomic motor neuron. So these are motor neurons that we cannot consciously control. These are going out to things like skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. 
cell bodies of these guys are going to be located in the lateral horn. Um, their axons are going to travel down. They're also going to emerge through the ventral root, and they're going to travel down, 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 where they emerge through the spinal nerve, and they make their way to that um, smooth muscle fiber or cardiac muscle fiber that they're going to stimulate. So they're also, these efferent motor, autonomic motor neurons are also going to go off the ventral root. The last type of um, neuron that I wanted to mention is an interneuron. An interneuron is just a fancy name for a neuron that connects two other neurons together. A great way to think about this is uh, with spinal reflexes. So let's imagine that um, you just burned your hand, you just touched like a super hot pan or something. And that's going to send a very strong signal through these sensory afferent neurons, lots of action potentials. It's going to be so strong that it's going to stimulate a interneuron, which is going to jump right over to... the somatic motor neuron on the same um, level of that spinal cord. It's going to stimulate these somatic motor neurons without the brain even being involved, and that's going to send out motor commands. So remember, I just grabbed like a super hot pan and burned my hand. It's going to send out um, somatic motor, it's going to stimulate somatic motor neurons, which are going to stimulate things like the extensors of my forearm to contract, which causes me to release that pan. It might even stimulate some muscle fibers in my bicep, which causes the elbow to flex. And it might even stimulate some muscle fibers in muscles like my, I don't know, teres major, which causes the, the, the arm to be um, flexed in this direction. So that is going to allow me to drop that pan, let, let it go before I do more damage to my, to my hand due to the hot handle. And that was what's great about that is that it happens super fast without the brain even having to, to worry about it, um, you know, because it takes time for that same signal to travel all the way up the spinal cord to the thalamus, then to the primary uh, somatosensory cortex, then we have to process that information, all that takes time. If we didn't have this spinal reflex, I'd still be holding on to that pan, I'd be doing lots more and more damage um, to my hand, all right, and that's kind of how all that works. So um, there's a kind of a quick little overview of how all that stuff um, works. And um, one more thing that I wanted to mention is that obviously uh, injuries to the spinal cord can be super devastating because this is part of the central nervous system. So these neurons lack the ability to be to regenerate like um, neurons of the peripheral nervous system. They're going to be coded in these oligodendrocytes, which do not have the regenerative ability like Schwann cells do. So any injury to um, these horns or any of the roots that are very close to the spinal cord are going to be devastating. In their, like, so if a, if a ventral root is damaged, that's going to cause uh, paralysis, whereas if a dorsal root is damaged, that's going to cause numbness. If the spinal cord is injured at anywhere um, or if it's um, completely severed anywhere along uh, the spine, that's going to prevent the body from trans from communicating with the brain, um, which could lead to things like paraplegia, quadriplegia, devastating um, injuries. All right, that's it. Thank you.